Welcome to the Sleeping Barber Podcast. I can't properly describe what you're about to experience, so I'll just leave it at this. That if you've never heard Eddie Obeng speak before, I totally encourage you to follow the links in the notes below and watch his TED Talk called Smart Failure for a Fast Changing World. It's amazing. Eddie's amazing. You're going to love this show, I'm sure. Welcome to the Sleeping Barber Podcast, a place for business leaders to get the best and most credible information on marketing, strategy, and innovation. Your hosts, Mark Binkley and Vasily Sturos, share their experiences as they gather insights from the world's leading experts. Now, on with the show. Welcome to the show. Today, we've got a really special guest, Eddie Obeng. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Delighted to be here, Mark. Yeah, this is really exciting. So today we're going to be talking about how to lead a high performance modern organization, um, which you know a lot about. Um, <laughs> uh, there's there's a lot of you know episodes that we've had so far where we've talked to guests about like technology and then media measurement and strategy and planning and all those things. We haven't really talked about people <laughs> and the processes and the yeah. systems that kind of go into making a high performance organization. So that's, you know, a big part of what we're hoping to get into with you today. Um, we're super excited to have you here to, to, to do this. You are a doctor. Uh, you, <laughs> you've, you've been the CEO and the learning director for the Pinnacle Virtual Business School. Uh, I could say you're, you're a metaverse pioneer, <laughs> um, <laughs> software developer, um, you know, ambassador for the Association of Project Management, professor at the Henley Business School at the Duke's the School of Duke um, uh, in the growth and innovation and entrepreneurship you're a multi multi-time author uh, TED talk alum and an in-demand speaker I mean there's a whole lot of things. you got two pages on Eddie yeah I, 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 yeah I've been working <laughs> yeah. we're gonna put a whole bunch of links in the end of the show notes for for you as well um, but just to open up like we met a long time ago uh, well, relatively, uh, through your Pinnacle Virtual Business School. And at the time for me, it was like impossible to explain what that was. It was this weird to me, like weird to try and explain it thing that ends up being the metaverse or part of <laughs> like a version of the metaverse. A working version that, of the metaverse. <laughs> yeah, a working version of the metaverse. Where people <laughs> from around the world. A version of the metaverse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And people from around the world were like showing up in this virtual space and doing work and meeting and at the same time. And it was really fascinating. Maybe because now we see metaverse and it's everywhere and remote work is everywhere. But you've been doing this for like 20, 30 years, I think. Yeah. Why did you start that? So it's it's, it's a long and short story. I, I used to be a, a director at a place called Ashridge Business School. And um I got involved in trying to turn the organization around when it was going wrong. So I had to pay attention. Uh, and when I paid attention, I discovered things like typical business school, and it was executive education. There was one person delivering the learning for like five to seven people to support them. Uh, right. And I thought, that's really weird. Um, people had to travel to us to learn stuff, and then they disappear. So you never found out whether they ever applied anything until the client bought again. Then you discover that they hadn't actually done anything. So it was quite traditional, and quite normal. I got fed up with it and left and started Pentacle. And at Pentacle, within the first year, we'd flipped it completely so that we had five people delivering, for one person supporting. So that's a productivity shift of, I can't do some. Somebody can work it out for me. But massive. And the question was, how did you do that? And it wasn't just the systems and the technology. It was also the people, the culture, uh, and, right. and so on. Um, so the other thing we did was... One of the things here at Pentacle is we like to drink our own champagne. Other people think mm -hmm. say things like, eat your own dog food. We say drink our own champagne because our, our stuff is mm -hmm. cool. Okay. <laughs> and so one of the tools which we use is something called a gap leap, which Mark, you might be familiar with. But it's basically, mm -hmm. you know, you want to do something. What's the difference between where you are and where you'd like to be? That's the gap. Then you discuss what happens if you don't fix it. Oh, bad stuff on some good stuff. What happens if you do fix it? And then why not fix yet? And we look at our clients and they were trying to change their, their way of working, improve their, their performance, get to their customers, deliver their projects and so on. And it became right. clear that they, they, there was a gap. They couldn't do it. They couldn't all get together and together 
easily and cheaply. They couldn't share. They couldn't learn while they were in meetings. Meetings were all just about talking. So if they didn't fix it, they just continued staying at the same platform and they couldn't actually change. But if we could fix it, we could accelerate the, relate, the, the development. We could make them more, more productive. We could train them whilst they were working. We could bring together people from around the globe so that they all work together. There were huge benefits. So the question was, well, why haven't you done it yet? And the answer was, because there's no mechanism to easily bring people together in a human grown-up way where they don't feel that, that the technology is the barrier. I'll give you a quick ex- example. This mm-hmm. might make a, you know, all technology has a problem because human beings are flexible. It's right. Meat flexible, okay? Hand flexible. And I have a pen in my hand. So imagine I have a pen in my hand if you're just listening. Um, guess what? My fingers have to do the moving around to, for the pen to work. The pen doesn't do anything. So human beings always have to adapt to technology because technology is usually designed to be less flexible than human beings. And when you start using Mm -hmm. technology for people communicating or working or getting together, most technology, it limits you. So you're sending text messages. You can't hear anything. So you can't tell the person's tonality. Uh, It goes one way, then the other. You can't both speak at the same time. There's no laughter. So we wanted to build something which was for grown-ups to be able to learn fast and work together and feel comfortable and give them a culture where they could really just make stuff happen. And that's why we built Q, uh, which is where you came, Mark. So that, that was the mm-hmm. idea behind it. So that's why, how we got there. But of course, because it came from customer need, and uh, right. we're, we're quite a small organization, we couldn't do all the branding to tell people what it was. And, they, it, and no one else is doing it. So it's hard to explain to anyone what it was about. All you could do is talk about the results. And mm-hmm. you could have you could have bought up the the name Metaverse early on, and then <laughs> Facebook would have had to call themselves something else. <laughs> yeah. Have you have you found that in in this transition? So obviously, when you're first kind of kicking this off, there probably was this barrier. Like, are people really comfortable with this online setting? But if you kind of fast forward to today, do you find that clients are likely more uh, what's the right word here? More accepting um, to this to this forum. Um. The sad part is that there are a lot of organizations who, who um, they got forced to change during the lockdowns. Right. So it mm-hmm. wasn't willing change. So what they've done is they've gone from being inefficient and working dispersed and not really collaborative, collaborating and thinking together and having fun and all those things. They've gone from that to, we'll do it a different way. We've been forced into it. I'll tell you what, let's just move these documents around on SharePoint and stare at each other's foreheads on Zoom, you know, or Teams. So unfortunately, there's a lot of organizations who have got into this trough where they're they're literally failing. All the people are miserable. They're having mental health issues. Uh, The staff are quitting because they hate it. um, And we can't reach them. So so there's a big tranche of organizations who haven't changed. Because they didn't right. want to change, but the people who wanted to change that, they, yeah, of course, they, they they go, oh, this is useful. We never thought of doing it this way. But there's right. a huge bulk of organisations, and the other headache they've got is um, uh, technology security. So what happened was during the lockdown thing, um, everything got technological got got done, and so all the IT security people who were pretending they were so important to the organisation, we suddenly discovered that they weren't adding any value. So the moment the lockdown stuff had happened and we suddenly started to use the investments people had made in virtual conferencing and stuff over decades, um, as they settled down, all the IT and security people went, we've got to show them we're important again. So, <laughs> so in most organisations, you can't put in any technology, which they haven't approved. And they have no clue what the business does. So they only approve stuff which comes from the sort of the big name organizations, the Microsofts and so on, which is all the stuff which everyone else is using. There's no competitive advantage. It tends to be restricting like my pen and uh, fingers example. And everyone works mm. the same way and, or they all hate it. So uh, it's quite funny, really. Mm-hmm. Long before COVID happened, like COVID to me was this moment in time um, that you would def- probably call like the world after midnight. I mean, yes. world after midnight is its own separate thing. But for everyone else, there was this moment where there was a, a before and then there was an after. Yes. And there was a, somewhat of an awakening, especially in terms of like people performance and the ability to work different ways and that kind of thing. Um, could you just describe the world after midnight? Because I feel like that's a <laughs> foundational component of your teaching and your approach and your philosophy. Yeah, so I tripped across this one. Um, it's quite a while ago uh, when I was actually again at Ashridge, 
And I tripped across it while I was doing sort of bits of research for courses. And when I first discovered it, it's I just the light bulb went on in my head. And I realized that something had changed in the world, but we hadn't noticed it. So, for example, at business school, we we're still teaching case studies, but the case studies were much less useful because the world was very different. We're still teaching like multi individual disciplines, you know, finance, um, um, operations, da, da, da. Whereas most problems which needed to be solved in organizations were pan dimensional, multifunctional. So suddenly you went, hang on, something's changed and we hadn't, I hadn't noticed it. And the world after midnight idea is very, um, it's very straightforward when, when you've understood it, but I'll, I'll describe it and hopefully you'll, 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 you'll realize. You would have noticed things which happen, which now no longer sort of, you can't figure out why they don't work anymore, like budgets. You know, we used to do annual budgets and they seem to make sense. People still do them and they make no sense, okay? Mm -hmm. um, we used to do like projects where we had clarity of the goals and the methods and sign off and stuff. And people are now running agile where they're just making it up as they go along. Um, and so on and so forth. In, in marketing, we used to understand our oh, customer segments. Now we discover that it's it's just so much more complicated and it's better to work from the individuals and to use data brokers to track the, you know, the, the whole thing's broken. So why? Well, there are about half a dozen things which flipped over. Um, when I'm teaching and I'm being in a real hurry, I just do one of them because people can see that. I talk about the pace of change. And I say, look back at the pace of change 20, 30 years ago. How was it then? <laughs> and anyone who is sort of at least 20 years old goes, I guess it was a bit slower then. You know, people used to walk around, et cetera. They used to travel to work for an hour on a train and stuff. So you can imagine that the past, let me do it that way. The past was low in change, okay, and is much higher. But when the past mm -hmm. was low in change, one of the things we got was we got satisfaction of knowing what we were doing. Why? Because we could learn faster than the world was changing. So you mm -hmm. could plan your budget and made sense. You could do your project work. You could see what the segment was. You knew what the, the what part of that, the, the, et cetera. Okay. But bad news is as the change accelerated, our ability to learn stayed quite flat. So we flipped from we can learn faster than the world is changing to the world can change faster than we can learn. Once you hit that mm -hmm. particular thing, you suddenly discover that almost everything you've built in your organization doesn't make sense because your boss can't give you guidance because they don't know what they're doing either, for example. So the organizational hierarchical structure is a little bit broken. So that's one. And that's an easy one. People get that. And then you can say, well, what do you do if you can't learn as fast as the world is changing? How should you behave differently? Mm -hmm. But there are five others which really, really, really mess you around. Cyberspace and data has done the same accelerating curve. Mm -hmm. Yet our ability to actually extract information from our data is flat. So there's mm -hmm. tons of stuff and you're trying to work out, well, what's important? What's right? What's wrong? Um, uh, which one's useful? What's not useful, etc. And so that's another little thing which people drown in. Um, also, the connections and the complexity and the number of influences, that has exponentially grown whilst our ability to notice patterns of change, you know, which areas are growing, what's happening, is flat. So that's flipped as well. And then we've got some other things like, um, which are more, more sort of human, like um, uh, compassion. Uh, everyone seems compassionate in a very, you know, they want everyone to have a good life. And I mean, that's why we're so stressed about, you know, the world situation and climate and all these things. It's because we're trying to really make things good. That's called whoosh. But challenges stayed flat. So we flip from, you know, make sure you can perform and suffer a little bit too. Oh, everyone should be happy. Well, don't worry if we didn't deliver any business results this year. We'll see how it goes. Star satisfaction has gone through the roof. ESG scores are great. Okay. So we flipped that one as well. We also flipped um, uh, um, the whole thing about um, control. So the organization, the management, they always want tons of control. Um, um, but that, so, but, but, Still, at the same time, we understood things like, you know, if we have too much control, the customers won't buy from us. So we let some people associated with us, like customers and maybe suppliers and innovators, have a little bit of autonomy and a little bit of agency. But now, mm -hmm. because there's so much pressure on, everyone's trying to control everything. And you'll notice it coming through government. You'll notice it coming everywhere where control has flipped over autonomy. And so things like customer centricity are almost seem like a bad thing. You know, oh, you're going to customer. We, can, we don't control the customer. You're going to let them leave our business. How does that work? It's, so there's a panic around that. But the real killer is, um, is, is the best way I describe it is 
when you talk about wealth, okay, people think you're talking about money, but wealth is the things you can use, your clothing, your friends, real tangible things which can make you your life better. But if I said, um, what, what's, the, what's the value of your house? The value of your house, your house is the wealth, but the value depends on the last uh, price that the last uh, property on your road got sold for. Value and wealth are not the same. Because if an idiot bought the house down the road for you for twice the normal price, the value of your house goes up. And what's happened is the value of everything has risen, but the wealth, the creation of real stuff of value in the human world is pretty flat. And part of it is because mm. the government's just printed money like it was going out of, out of fashion, but also because everyone's in a hurry to have everything. So they're willing to give more value to things than they're actually worth in terms of the wealth they bring you. So those are all broken. Um, and so the world after midnight is understanding this flip from how it used to work to how it works now. And the reason I call it World After Midnight is because the joke is, you know, it happened at midnight whilst everyone's asleep and we just carried on the same way, but the world doesn't work the same way as we think it does. So we spend all our time doing things we think are rational, but actually they're just nonsense. Um, have I explained it well, Mark? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I clear as mud. Well, I, yeah, I used to... <laughs> I used your line the other day. We we were interviewing someone about the applicant, the way you apply to jobs. And and so there's this whole system around like hiring a person where pe- there's applicants filling in systems, like filling in job applications. And then there's people on the other end thinking they're going to find candidates. And I'm like, we're all acting rationally to this world that actually doesn't exist because nobody finds a job that way. I mean, no. Percentages are really low, but there's like... It's just a fascinating thing because we're all doing stuff thinking that this is the right way to do it. Yeah. And there's different motivators for reasons why we're doing things the way we are. But <laughs> it, the, in that particular case, it just doesn't actually make a ton yeah, of I sense. Yeah, I mean, the, the, I, I could describe it at three levels. So at the individual level, we have our own habits, which we've dis- developed. And if you're older, you built habits in the old world. You know, when you could learn fast, the world was changing. So, for example, you might put the date you produce a document. You might put the date of production of the document. But in the new world, it's more interesting to, when you pick up a document of some facts to know if they're still valid. So you should actually put the sell-by date. This mm. document is valid and will make sense till the end of the quarter. You should put the sell- but you put the date you did the work. And that's the habit you do. You don't even think about it. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there are all these heuristics we use about how things should be done, which are deep in our minds, but they no longer apply. So you find yourself doing lots of behavior. At the organizational level, your example is absolutely perfect. We put in policies of this is what this, but we must sign this thing off in triplicate to IT security. Okay, what, why? Okay, the world has moved on. Is it still relevant? Everything's on, a, on the cloud, you know, or, you know, the, our process for recruiting people is fill in this form to make sure you fill it. It's, it's, but but the policies and the processes in the organizations just they run irrespective of reality and at a national level or global level we get exactly the same thing where all these countries have all these laws which they created and the world's moved and the laws no longer work anymore you know because we're now working with data and so on and so forth it, it, it's one set of headaches and then they have they try and create new laws. And we've got in the, U- in the UK, we've got this thing called hate laws. I don't know whether you guys have got it. But I used to be an engineer, okay? So when somebody says hate, I go, right, what are the dimensions? Is that feet or inches or is it kilograms? And I, you know, you cannot measure it. If you can't measure it precisely, it's really hard to have a law about it. But they don't mm, know. Fair, so they're yeah. still creating laws, but now they're creating laws on concepts. <laughs> you know, it's bizarre. Um, institutions, yeah. we used to have these things called institutions. They check up on us and they would make sure everyone did things safely, etc. And then they didn't realize, but as the world globalized, people in the institutions would look around and see other people made more money, okay? And so they'd work in the institution, go, where do I go now? And then they get a job in the company they've been regulating. So the institutions, they have this revolving door. So the institutions cease to be but we all think that things somehow they're protecting us, but they don't exist anymore. You know, so, so it's so funny at every single level, this flip in the world after midnight where um, everything we imagine is happening is completely different from what's actually imagining. Sorry, I'm, I'm talking too much. No, no, no. <laughs> this is fascinating because obviously there's a lot of things that one could unpack just in, in that definition in terms of, you know, world after midnight. 
Um, my mind goes to with such an accelerated accelerated rate of things changing. You think about you talked about technology, the cyberspace, um, etc. Do you feel like there's going to be a time where we can catch up um, in terms of <laughs> and really kind of understand what this new state looks like? Because I'm looking at this and I'm like, now we have AI that's coming in and it's just going to accelerate things even further. Are we just doomed? Like, do we just, <laughs> just just close up shop? So, so three or four different things is worth remembering. The first is that um, change and improvement are not the same thing. Really okay. important. Um, so there you go. I changed. <clears throat> I moved my hand. I changed the change. Did it make your life better? No. Uh, you can change millions of things, but improvement is something which helps you move towards your goals better, easier, or whatever. Okay, improvement is mm -hmm. a subset of change. So you don't need to learn everything. You just need to be able to improve in terms of what you're trying to achieve. That's, that's really quite crucial. Uh, mm -hmm. The second is laws of change. First law of change is one change leads to another. So even as you start to improve, you accelerate the environment around you. Okay, you, you can't, having learned, slow the world down. Uh, the only way you can do that is if you can break the world into smaller bits. And at the moment, we've connected the whole world up. So one change always needs right. another. It just gets more complicated um, and complex. Um, so uh, a lot of people are doing a lot of activity, which they think is improvement, but it's just change because they probably don't understand. You mentioned AI. They just, when it gets, <laughs> I don't know about you, but when when things get, when things get sort of difficult, what, there are ways you can, you can operate. One is you can go, well, I shall rely on my own beliefs and I shall go with my own way, okay? Right. If you do that, you're what I call a mutant because <laughs> intelligent, normal people, they just do what everyone else does because that's the smart thing the monkeys have done forever. If everyone's eating the red fruit and no one's eating the blue fruit, eat which fruit? Eat the red fruit. That's a smart play, Okay. So what happens is somebody goes, AI, they'll go, AI, they'll go, AI, 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 AI. Okay, they all run after the AI, okay? But the person who says, no, actually, I'm going to go do that, the chances the blue fluids are blue fluids going to kill them. So they're mutants. So there are very few people who do that. And so a lot of people are doing a lot of activity, not because it's going to help them, but because it's the human thing to join the crowd. Hmm. When it comes to... The one point you brought up about um, like the proliferation of data and there's so much data. Yeah. And so our ability to learn is not exceeding. And so, you, but the pace of change is, and so kind of just building on that there, especially in business, people want to know answers. Like, is it working? Mm -hmm. You know what we're doing? Is it working? Is it incremental? Like we've had these conversations about measurement and strategy. Like is the strategy working? And so you have all this, data flowing in more and more um, and but you have these people on the other end that are trying to interpret the data so from a high performance point of view like what do you do about the world after midnight and and how do you help build up the skill sets within people so that they can not just pick out things and stories from the data that support their own personal biases but actually actually prove whether things are improving for the organization. Sure, absolutely. So the first thing is that data is fascinating. I did a conference once uh, with IT professionals and data, whatever it is, you know, storage people. I went on stage and I don't know, a couple of thousand people there. I walked on stage and I said, I shouldn't be here because I'm a fraud. So silence, of course. And your keynote speaker says he's a fraud, you're in trouble. Uh, I said, uh, the reason I'm a fraud is because I don't know what data is. Can you help me? And silence, okay. I said, well, what's data? I said, and I wrote on my on the board, 42. I said, is that data? Put your hand up if you think it's data. So hands went up, but not all of them, okay? So I said, well, what's wrong with it? So Why is that not data? And, and somebody said, what? 42 what? I said, 42 years, okay? And so is this data? So hands were up, now went down, and other hands went up. So I proved they have no clue what data is. <laughs> <laughs> they have no clue. We're all frauds, okay? And so he said, what, what, 42 years what? I said, yeah, 42. I said, 42 years old, I wrote. And, uh, and somebody said, what do you? I said, is it data? Now they're all hiding their hands. And I said, come on, 42 years old. Is that data? Is that information? What is that? And then somebody said, what's 42 years? I said, correct. Question plus data equals information, which is the answer you can act upon. That's the formula. Question plus data equals information, which is the answer you can act upon. So if you'd asked me, how old are you, Eddie? And I replied, 
42 years, question plus data, 32 years old. That's information. That's an answer you can act on. Bad news. It's wrong information because I'm not 42 years old. So I've also explained about data quality at the same time. So that's probably the shortest keynote speech I've ever done. But far more importantly, <laughs> it's important to understand the questions you want to put into the system. So where do the questions come from? So what are the questions you're trying to ask? So there are eight categories of question, but I'll give you six headings. It's like a two by two uh, square. So sometimes you want to know, is it more or less than? That's what's known as a relative measure. Okay. Sometimes you want to know the absolute measure. Did anyone buy it? Is it working? Yes, no. So there's a relative and an absolute. And sometimes you want the relative answer. Sometimes you want the absolute answer. You have to decide which one you want. Um, because if you say, what were sales last week? And I say 400 units. It's a question, but it's not useful to you. Because your question was, is this week better than last week? So you want a relative answer. Then you want to also have measures which are both hard and soft. So 42 sales, great. And then I might ask, are all the customers happy? Soft question. That's far more, that's, that's, that will give you, so it, the soft question might tell you if they're likely to buy again. The hard question told you they bought last week. So there's absolute relative, there's hard and soft, and there's internal mm -hmm. and external. Some of the measures you want are inside your organization. Like we produce four units. External might be six of our customers told their friends to buy one. That's not inside your organization. So when you're formulating your question, you usually want the question answer to be able to hit those three different dimensions in order to get a metric which is meaningful. Um, there's tons of metrics which are totally useless. Um, and it, it, people just can't, they can't interpret them because they don't know how to deal with data. We've already talked about that. I like that formula because I think it simplifies the, I guess, kind of like it puts structure around it a little bit. So then now you can pressure test that anytime someone's throwing information or data at you, you they can quickly data. be like, hey, wait. Validate your data. Yeah, yeah. They're it's throwing data at you, right? It's like. Correct. Correct. I, I think you must formulate the question great. you need. And what used to happen yeah. in the old world was we'd go to meetings and the meetings were, were really like, I call them fairy tales because the whole meeting would be <laughs> what happened last month and how did it happen? That, that was, mm -hmm. I don't know about you, but those are the meetings I would go to. They'll go, right, so uh, uh, what happened with manufacturing? Well, we, we got 12 units out. How did that happen? And then somebody just makes up a story because usually you <laughs> don't know why it worked or it didn't work and you're making up a story. So it's a fairy tale. So everything was about what worked in the past and how it worked in the past. In the new world, world after midnight, you want to know what might happen and how might we bring it about. And so you, it's a different set of type of question. Um, mm -hmm. and, but most of the meetings I drop in and when a client invites me on, they're still spending 80% of their time doing the, looking in the rear view mirror. Whereas in World of Midnight, you want to spend 80% of your time looking forward and only yeah. look backwards if it helps you make sense of what could happen next. Mark and I had a shared manager that actually would use that line quite often. It's like, you can't move a company forward if you're constantly driving in the rear view mirror, right? And I think yeah. it's... It's a great visual to kind of be like, hey, why are we looking at data, past data as a way to influence what we should be doing in the future, right? right. And I think it's, um, yeah, I like that you you brought that back. But it's so. a good heuristic because in the old world, yesterday looked like tomorrow. Yeah, it was a lot more consistency. Exactly. So yeah. the, the smart play was do more of what you did yesterday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Like, it's that, so that it's was that the hurting smart mentality. play, but the world's changed. Yeah. There's no longer the smart play, but nobody's told anyone, so they're still doing it. Yeah. It, it, I, I kind of want to go back to the, the, when I was doing research, I, I stumbled on your uh, five monkeys fable that you had talked about before. And you kind of brought up the monkey thing again. And, and I, but there is value in having some weirdos that do get the blue fruit. <laughs> See if they die. There's always those are some the of weirdos are great. The mutants, weird, they're fantastic. The thing is often organizations have already fired them. So the whole organization yeah. has no weirdos. <laughs> Because the weirdos, they're a real problem. You know, I don't know. The boss says, right, guys, we should look at the front view mirror. But he said it because he read it in the Harvard Business Review thing. So he repeats this thing. And everyone goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so they go, right, what should we do? Well, let's try and sell more of what we're selling. And everyone goes, yeah, yeah. And in other words, they've all agreed to nonsense. The weirdo will put their hand up and say, you know, we're still doing that stuff. So they've been fired. So often there aren't any weirdos. That's, that's a really big issue. Uh, and then there's a question of the weirdos getting enough uh, space and power and credibility to influence the way the organization moves, moves forward. So the weirdos of, uh, who are effective usually have 
unusually good people skills. So they sort of weave their way through and influence people without people noticing them, almost like a ninja, you know, sort of sliding, sliding through. So they use techniques like um, playing back what people have said. Uh, there's a tool I built called Issue Data Question Build, where they, they get you to invent the idea in your head and you think it's your idea, whereas actually it's their idea. So that's what those weirdos do in order to make the organization work. Because if they just come out and say, you guys are batshit crazy, um, they get fired. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> I think you're kind of right, actually. <laughs> they do get marginalized for sure. Yeah, they're too much trouble. Is so when it comes to the 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 weird the mutants and the weirdos and and but then the other people that are um, eating the regular fruit, um, is there a balance to have like to manage people in a in a succinct way, or can you create? Can you convert temporarily the the regular red fruit eaters into blue fruit eaters for a period of time to yeah, make them weird question. for a little bit and then bring That's them back? That's a great question. It's a great question. Great so, question. Um, so let's do them at different levels. Yes, you can create. So, um, I've done lots and lots of innovation teaching over the years, okay? And I'm usually working with what I call normal people, okay? Normal people who are not mutants, if you ask them to come up with a weird and wacky idea, they never do. And it might be because they can't, because I think some of the wires have to be a bit loose before you become completely weird. So it's possible that. But also because they will not put up with the shame of looking stupid. Mm-hmm. Oh, so yeah. they come up with normal, acceptable ideas. You know, they don't come up with wacky, weird, out of the box things because they never want to look at you. You're going to do what? Are you crazy? You know, so they, they just won't do it. So I built a whole set of, I call them people engagement tools, performance engagement tools, uh, productivity uh, 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 enhancement tools, et cetera, et cetera. I call them pets. But I built these different pets, which will let people, for example, come up with weird ideas and not get a stigma. So one of my favorites mm-hmm. is something called sliced bread, S-L-I-Z-E-D-B-R-E-D, because in the UK, the expression is uh, best thing since sliced bread. It's a way of describing a real innovation. In sliced bread, you have the problem and you describe it and you describe it to normal people who are sensible. And you say, great, each of you is going to take on a role. So you're going to pretend to be the boss. You're going to pretend to be the customer. You're going to pretend to be the mother. You're going to pretend to be the pedestrian. OK, and so this is the idea. And you have to say from that point of view, what you think you should we should change about it to make it perfect. And so now, of course, they don't they have nothing they have nothing to lose. Well, speaking as the mother, I would say this thing should be in a red box. So normally, if they just said put it in a red box, they would go, "Are you crazy, person? Red box?" Well, it's not me. The mother said it. So I have built mm-hmm. methods which allow them to distance themselves from the embarrassment of coming up with something weird and wacky. I love that. So, so you can mechanically take sensible, normal people and make them perform in terms of new ideas. If you bring the right uh, tools to help them to do to do that, so to help them so loosen the screws in their head, right? Great. Mm-hmm. The second one is, of course, the culture. In other words, is anyone going to laugh at them? And if you've got the wrong sure. culture, then people are going to laugh at them. And one of the things you'd have experienced on Cube Mark is when you become an avatar and you come into our metaverse, into Cube, you immediately experience a completely different culture because mm-hmm. we've designed it as a culture which is a high-performing culture. So everyone comes in and they're all the same shape and there's no advantage to anyone. So, okay, so we don't know who the boss is, okay? When we're doing stuff, we have um, uh, rituals like write the sticky before anyone discusses it. So everyone gets Mm -hmm. a chance to put their ideas forward. It's a sticky, so you're not going to be embarrassed. It might be even an anonymous anonymous sticky. So all of a Mm -hmm. sudden, you've allowed people to participate without having to... um, uh, embarrass them. And then when we discuss, we do the thing called spin casting, where people speak in a sequence, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. So the introverts get time to speak, and they're called on to speak, and the extroverts have to shut up once they've done their bit. <laughs> mm-hmm. So the culture allows people to participate. So you can do it at a cultural level as well. Uh, and then the other thing, of course, is you can train up the weirdos so that people don't hate them so much. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> I love this. I love this. So uh, I wanted I wanted to kind of come back a little bit um, when when we start thinking about like you know we talked about the acceleration, especially the, the acceleration that we had in COVID, right? So yeah. you saw a technology go up all of a sudden, adoption of this new state um, really kind of set 
course that everyone believed that, oh my goodness, there's no coming back from this now. Everyone's going to be working remotely. There's no one that's going to put up with, you know, uh, going back to the office. But if, you know, even between Mark and I, the, the whole bunch of roles that we've applied for, et cetera, we've seen that there's this push now to get people back in the office. Yeah. So, so a lot of it is because they're citing collaboration. It's better to be te- build teams uh, when everyone's under the same roof, so to speak, again, um, being a part of those water cooler conversations, et cetera. Right. So from your perspective, are there lessons that are being missed about remote work? That could oh, help yeah. us work better in the future. Yeah. Okay. So, so, um, <laughs> so where to start? So the push is coming from different directions. So if you're in corporate real estate or you own your corporate real estate, you really want people back in the office. Okay. So there's a big <laughs> sort of economic push for that. But from an organizational point of view, it's also quite interesting. I mean, I know they say water cooler conversations, but even when they were in the office, people just sat at their desk. They never were anywhere near water cooler. So that's another thing altogether. But there is a real requirement to collaborate and to think together. Go back to the tools I described. Everyone tells you they're working remotely. Now, being an engineer in the past, definition of work is progress through difficulty. Okay. So the question is, what's the difficulty they're progressing through? The difficulty is they all have their own little documents in their own little space, and then they put it in SharePoint. Then they stand and talk to each other on Teams, staring at each other's foreheads with the introverts talking, and then nothing really happens. Then they go to the next Teams conversation, next, 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 get to the end of the day. Then they shuffle their documentation again, and they try and present it as if something has happened. And all they're doing is they're not collaborating. Collaboration is not about pass the parcel or commenting. It's not teamwork. It's not cooperation. Collaboration is thinking together. So thinking together is a different culture. It's about providing a space where everyone can be heard. It's providing a memory. So on Cube, for example, you go and you do something. It's on the wall. You come back next week. It's still on the wall because the memory is preserved. So you can go back to it and build upon it. And you can work asynchronously because it's there. So if I have an idea, I can add to it or a comment. And so it's not, oh, the hours come up, end of Teams meeting, think about something else. So almost everything which people have adopted as technology to enable remote work makes it more difficult because they literally just bought video conferencing systems, which in the 70s didn't work, but now they're much nicer. <laughs> <laughs> they're not for collaboration. Nobody laughs on the team's call. It's too embarrassing. There are all sorts of bad things in terms of how they affect you hormonally. You have 12 faces staring at you. Now, we are prey animals, eyes in the front, stereoscopic vision. Sheep and, and cows, they have eyes on the side to look around for everything else, okay? So when you're staring at prey animals, if you were physically in a room, you would look at one person and look at the other person and look at the third person. You don't look at all 14 of the, all the time, 14 hours. When you're doing that on the screen, your brain is going predator, predator, predator. Cortisol is building up in your system. We're getting ready to give you terrible cancer and all that. So the <laughs> tools they've adopted are terrible. Then they can't change them because the IT police won't let them adapt them in any way, <laughs> shape or form. Okay. Everyone's so suffering through them and they're having to progress their work through difficulty. And I am biased, but I've worked on Q for 20 years and we built it ourselves. So if it's rubbish, we suffer. So hence the drinking your own champagne. And so we've yeah. learned things like it's more important to look at the document than to look <coughs> at the person. So when you're on Cube, when you gather around a document, you all look at the document. You don't look at the other avatars. That's not interesting. You concentrate on the document because mm. that's, that's neutral and, and helpful. We know things like you have to break things into small, smaller bits so that you don't have one person talking for more than seven minutes and so on and so forth. So we've learned how to make an environment which feels more human almost than a normal meeting. In fact, it is more human than a normal meeting. So the remote working stuff is is just a nightmare. The other thing we do with clients on Cube is we put their offices on Cube, we put their cafes on Cube, we put their project rooms on Cube. If they're physically together, instead of taking their notes individually, my notes into my computer or my Word document or whatever it is, they log into the cubicle and they all work on the same document. So the people who are in the room are all working on Cube in an office or in a project room, putting everything there. And if somebody's remote, they could be in the room or they can come in later. So merging whether you are together or whether you're apart is the crucial thing 
to people working when they are dispersed or together. There's only a few things they can't you can't do in an environment like Cube, like you can't easily eat together, um, have that meal and 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 so on. You know, you can't physically touch people. But even when we have coffee, we have this thing called the simultaneous sip because we realize in terms of hypnosis, if you say to everyone, okay, time for the simultaneous sip, if everyone takes a sip of the coffee at the same time and they go, ah. Everyone imagines they're in the same room laughing together. So, so we've done so much work on the psychology of people not work, being together. The big boys, the Microsofts of the world, they just put, you know, they do neuroscience and stuff, but they're not human enough because it's big teams and the teams studying it aren't the ones who are going to suffer it. So there's no feedback loop. So they come up with all these ideas, they voice on people, but they're never suffering it. So they can't improve and hone it. So work from home, is, it, it's, to me, it looks horrible. I don't have to do it, so I don't care. Yeah. But for other people, I think they do suffer a lot. And, and we've been asked recently to spend our time talking about how Q can help mental health because there's so many people struggling. Yeah. It, I, I keep coming back to this idea, and you kind of said it in various ways, but the way I wrote it down was like, imagine designing a high-performance org and then working backwards yeah. from there. As opposed to we have these businesses and then we're trying to make them high performance because we're <laughs> building off of these legacy systems and, and just trying to catapult into this Correct. position of a high performance organization and rather than working from the end in mind. Absolutely. Yeah, you're spot on. It, so, I mean, if you want to do things which are sort of excellent enterprise or excellent execution stuff, the, the stuff you need to do, like you've got to give people sort of some idea of, direction and future and sort of what might be useful in their future. And then you've got to help them orient as to when they are working together, what does it look like? Then you've got to give them capability and then you've got to make sure that they can actually do stuff which they can get get nice bits of dopamine from because they're making progress rather than just cortisol all the time. Uh, and then you've got to put some infrastructure. So there's some things you need to do. So taking an existing organization trying to get to leapfrog is really hard. The reason we use Cube for transformation is because nobody knows how to believe in, behave in a foreign country. When you go to a really foreign country and they say, we sit up cross-legged on the ground and eat with our left hands, you just join in. So it's the same when you mm -hmm. become an avatar and you land, land in Cube. We'll say, right, you're the home spot. You know, go and sit around the table and have a chat until we start, we talk. We literally tell people how to behave, what the rituals are, right first, talk second, and so on. And, what we, and we give them the tools. And then what we discover mm -hmm. is when they've done it, several times in the virtual world, when they come into their old organization, they do the new behaviors, they do the new rituals, and they start mm -hmm. to change the way in which that organization works without mm -hmm. the normal resistance to change. Because otherwise you just bump into the resistance to change is too difficult and everything just, everyone knows how to misbehave in the meeting. But having learned how to, for example, when we start a meeting, we'll do something called hopes and fears. What do you want? What don't you want? Because we know agendas don't work. Okay. And then we de-risk the meeting. And when we've done that three or four times, people will go to their team meeting or a call and say, right, guys, we've got 20 minutes. What, do you, what does everyone want? Fred, Bill, uh, Susan, et cetera. Great. Those are things we want. What don't we want? Uh, talking too much. Great. We're not going to talk too much. Everyone's going to be put here. This is the sequence. Let's go. So they start doing the behaviors they've done on Cube in real life. And that's one of the, the ways which we make real progress with trying to up performance um, uh, at a high rate. Eddie V uh, has witnessed the hopes and fears thing because we've done a couple of presentations together lately. I don't know if you know where that came from, V, but that's no. where, this is where because I, I would do the hopes and fears before, oh, like, fantastic. as, a, as an, a live agenda for the presentation. <laughs> but it's really great because then you get input right away from Correct. people. Exactly. And then you can cut, like, I know, like, we know what we're talking about. So we can adapt on the fly totally. to whatever Correct. they, the people want to hear. Yeah. yeah, it's fascinating. Yeah. And the other things, I mean, um, uh, th th there's a real importance in terms of, of making sure that you've got that alignment towards what the goal is. Um, uh, so on the side, there's the company organization is low performing. But these days, a lot of organizations have, I would say they, They've lost their way because they're either trying to do ESG. So there's like 20 different objectives. Is it about keeping mm -hmm. the staff happy? Is it about making money? Is it about the local community? So it's the managers end up not being able to guide or, or lead 
All they can do is acknowledge what people are trying to do and say, well done. And that's that compassion uh, beating challenge problem. Yeah. Um, yeah. And if you're trying to make an organization work, it's really hard um, uh, because people have lost that sense of purpose. I still think the secret is to focus on customers. I think what you do is you focus on the customers, then everything's going to be good from here. You identify, we're going to focus on customer. Customer is king. Then the question goes, well, which customer? Well, it depends on your strategy. If you're just trying to get bigger and bigger and bigger, then what you want is people give you lots of money and they've got scale. If you're trying to do stuff which is new, then you want people, companies who will get, or people will give you challenge. Some of them will give you a bit of money and a little, uh, several of them will be great partners as you start to move forward, okay? So, mm -hmm. so you want slightly different customers as your favorite customer. And then you start to orient to those customers and ignore all the others. And if one of those comes along, you charge them four times as much as the others because you don't want them, okay? So mm -hmm. you know which customers you're after. You focus on the ones. Then you orient everything else around the organization towards it. Make sure the products are right. Make sure the service levels are right and so on. Internally in the organization, you orient by using who's your internal customer. So everyone has to know who am I doing work for? I, who's my internal customer? Well, my boss is the internal customer for this. Uh, sales is an internal customer for that. Once they've got that mindset, if everyone's oriented around the internal customer and the people in touch with the customer are connected to the customer, it ripples through the, new, the organization. So less pointless work gets done. Everyone understands what they're oriented towards. And then you can bring it to bear and try and get some outcome. But that is sort of a lost art at the moment. Everybody's trying to, again, you know, they all copy each other. Oh, yes, are you doing SG? I'm doing SG. Are you doing it? Yeah. And then they all run around and then they struggle with the organizations because they can't make any sense of it. Um, so it's interesting. Yeah, because, you know, it's fascinating because it's almost like we're creating carbon copies all over the place. And you think about, you know, large organizations are going to hire the big consultancies. And they're going to come in. Well, what we're seeing in the industry is this shift to <laughs> ESG or, you know, you should be doing it because everybody else is doing it. And it, it kind of creates this constant, like, I don't want to call right. it maybe a vicious cycle, but yeah. it... It, perhaps, perhaps that's what's allow, not allowing us to get back to some of those, um, yeah, what's the right word? You talked about it earlier, just about making sure that we're um, really learning at the same rate that yes. potentially the world is changing around us. But we're just become so conditioned that, you know what, just look over the fence. If that if your neighbor is doing that, make sure you're doing that. Correct. Um, and it kind of takes some of that, uh, I guess, the, the excitement of trying to figure it out for yourself as well. Yeah, and also if, if everyone's doing it, there's usually no margins. So the people who are going to yeah. survive are the big guys or the yeah, cheapest of course. guys. The cheapest guys are the ones who are treating everyone around them like like hell because that's how they mm -hmm. got their extra money off by squeezing suppliers and not paying their staff and stuff like that. And then the big yeah. guys get it on scale, so they get a pot of money. But everyone else that's just sort of spirals downwards. It's, it's quite funny. Uh, and yeah. there's not much thought in there because they're all copying each other. I mean, things which make me laugh. I got involved in a... I was asked to talk about a company which is focused on diversity, focused on diversity. And so uh, they, <laughs> they invited me to talk. And I said, why have you selected me? And they said, oh, well, 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 they, okay. And so I started my, my, my opening joke is always the same. When I'm on the board of all these diversity things, people keep asking me. And I say, I was born in Ghana. You know, my name was, my name's Eddie. I was born in Ghana. And I was just Eddie and everyone knew. But then I was sent to a British public school and overnight I became black. Who knew? You know, and, <laughs> they don't laugh because they're not supposed to because of diversity. Okay. Sorry. But yeah. anyway, so, <laughs> so, so, but what I try to explain to them is look, if your target is diversity, you have to learn so many new things. You know, so there's a lovely experiment where they had, I think, six Japanese people together and they gave them a task with creativity and activity and they did it like in one hour and it was quite creative. They took one of the Japanese people out, put an American in, uh, and then they watched it. And guess what happened? It took longer, it was less creative. Why? Because only five people were doing it because they were speaking Japanese and ignoring the American. Then they added a Swede in, okay? And it took even longer because only four people were doing it. They're still speaking Japanese. Uh, the American yeah. and the Swede are doing their own thing and disrupting them, okay? And so on. So, so as you make it more diverse, the likelihood you can get alignment quickly goes down. And it keeps mm -hmm. going down. And it can either end up with really no performance, one Japanese, one of everything, and they're not fight they're fighting, they all hate each other. Or if you can figure out how to get them to refocus on ground rules, how might we work together? Okay, we don't all speak the same language. Let's do drawings, whatever it is. If you can show them how to build ground rules to allow them to participate and work as a team, then you stand the chance of improving. So it's, a, it's like a hockey stick. It goes down unless it goes up. And so the only way yeah. to get it to go up is to push on 
How are you bringing these diverse teams together? How are you teaching them how to build ground rules? Are you making sure that they bring up the difficulties rather than sit there too embarrassed to say they've got a difficulty in right. case somebody points at them and then nothing happens? So, so the entire effort was on let's hit the diversity targets, whereas what they should have been doing is building capability for diverse groups to function. So not only are they copying each other, they're copying each other to do completely pointless and stupid things. It, it would make a great Dilbert cartoon. Um, <laughs> so, like, I have so many questions and thoughts about this. But uh, one thing, okay, the, the one thing that I think is, is intriguing about this. So we have this business goal. We have diversity. We have things like ESG and, you know, the, the repetition the of some, yeah, save, save the whales kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. And then nobody and, asked the um, whales if they wanted to be saved. <laughs> you can't impose your you can't impose your vision on the whales, and I don't think they ask the fungi either. <laughs> yeah, this is a funny so, one because everyone wants to save the planet, and my normal joke is you can't save the planet. They go, yes, I can. I say you don't know what the planet wants. You don't know what the customers want. You don't know what the stakeholders want. They go, yes, we do. I said, no. Do you speak fungus? And they go, what? I said, well, yeah. you have no idea what the funky wants. You know what the whales want. You can't, you can't, you don't know what people want. You can't do it for them. They go, yes, yeah. we do. I said, well, if you think you do, that makes you a bit of a narcissist. And if you insist that you're a psychopath. So, <laughs> so, so saving the planet is just more nonsense. It's just nonsense. It's well, it's funny because asking people what they want and asking like the <laughs> Correct. Fungi, so Correct. so but to come into that you have to have research about yeah. ask, asking and so that's actually one of the things that we talk about a lot because it's the one of the first things that gets cut. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> and things get, so, Why do we my need research? Go, I'm sure we can guess what they want. <laughs> yeah. The the question I have coming back to all those things is you have in place to try and align people in an organization mm -hmm. KPIs. Yeah. And so <laughs> In those KPIs um, are intended to provide guardrails in a way of saying, here's what's good, here's what's working, here's what we believe is the number we need to measure to, to improve. Um, you have this really fascinating story about KPIs and about Tooth Fairy. <laughs> <laughs> and I just wanted to see if you could talk about that because whether it's for diversity or, or, you know, ESG or whatever the business objective is. Yeah, there's this... yeah. I mean, KPIs can be built, but I've already suggested, you know, those three dimensions to make sure you're actually looking at the right measurements, you know, the relative absolute. So you've got the right question in mind. Uh, but people tend to create KPIs. And then the problem with KPIs is they have an impact on how people behave. Because guess what? It's a KPI. Um, so just... Uh, the, the story you're probably referring to is my, my joke about tooth fairies. Um, and um, so everyone knows Santa Claus. When you're a kid, your parents persuade you there's Santa Claus. Um, and you can't imagine that adults will go to so much trouble to lie to you. So you believe it. And then the big kids tell you uh, there's no Santa Claus. It's your mom and dad. And you get annoyed with the big kids for lying. And then finally you figure out there's no Santa Claus. Okay. And then you can grow up. But the problem is if you have incentives, oh, now it's really hard. And that's what they do with the tooth fairy. The tooth fairy is an incentive-based bit of made-up fairy tale, okay? And it drives behavior. And the tooth fairy game is they tell you that when you lose a tooth, you get money, okay? And so mm -hmm. your, your brother and sister say, no, it's not the fairy who brought the money. It's your parents. Same story as the Santa thing. But with the Santa thing, you give up Santa quite easily. The tooth fairy is another nightmare because... You're incentivized. So you know that if you say there is no tooth fairy, you won't get the money. So your behavior continues despite the fact that you know it's not true. And within an organization, if you put KPIs in, especially if you don't give them like sell-by dates and so on, you can drive all sorts of weird behavior because no one's going to confess to it because you're incentivizing them and they will focus on the incentives, not the outcome. Not the outcome, not the capacity it gives you, not the capacity it gives you, not the, the, the way in which it's going to generate benefit. So they just concentrate on the incentives. So incentives and KPIs can be useful. But if you're going to ever put them in, get somebody to game them, get somebody you know and say, so we're going to incentivize people for a number, number of visits to doctors. And this is one which my client, one of my clients did ages ago. They incentivize the salespeople for visits to doctors, you know. Mm -hmm. And so guess what happened? 
A lot of people went to a lot of doctors. They went to a lot of doctors, okay? And in fact, when they audited it, they found that some of the doctors they visited had been dead for a long time. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, you see, because it's hard to get in to see a real doctor. So you get somebody who you know is a bit of a weirdo to role play your incentive structure, your KPIs, and they go, well, I'll just make up some doctor's names here. No one's going to catch me for three months. At least I'll get my quarterly bonus. And then you know it's not. So you always have to road test any KPI because it's so easy to come up with gibberish and people will game the system and continue pretending that they don't know there's no tooth fairy. I, ha- I was in pharma for a while and that was what we <laughs> we called them KP lies. KP lies. Like, you got to see six doctors a day and we're, a bunch of us were just putting a line in the sand saying, I can only see three. <laughs> no, no, no. You got to see six. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Next quarter, I saw six. <laughs> I love the I love the one mark that you share often. It's um, you'd leave like you'd be at a restaurant or a coffee shop, and you know people are they're doing a draw, so you leave your business card in. So that's oh yeah, when you were in yeah, sales, yeah. you would just take some of those business cards and say these are leads. <laughs> yeah. Exactly, that's it. <laughs> you, yeah, you grab the fish bowl, you grab the cards from the fish bowl. Like, yeah. the people that put their card in for a free lunch, yeah. and then you come back and you go, oh, I saw all these people. Look at all these people. <laughs> I'll tell you what's what's better. If you call the person who's got their card in there, you can start by saying, this is your lucky day. Because you know that the sort of person whose mindset is they want luck. That's why they left their card there. So you've already qualified the prospects. That's right. (laughs) That's genius. So yeah, so KPIs are just, yeah, you have to be ever so careful with them. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm coming across organizations now who are trying to put KPIs for <coughs> use of AI. It's madness. It's just, AI is fun to me. I mean, it's uh, it's another one of those things where everybody's, everyone's doing it. They don't know why. And AI is mm-hmm. hilarious at all the different levels. My business partner, David Lomas, uh, he, he, he basically, he's a, pro, he's a computer genius. And 40 years ago when he was doing his doctorate, it was in AI, machine learning. And only problem is in those days, the computers were so slow, they couldn't do the sums. Uh, yeah. These days, mm-hmm. the computers can do the sums because of the gaming machines, which do four by four matrices. But the thing about artificial intelligence is that both the words are, are stretches of reality. So the artificial, everyone thinks it refers to the fact it's not real. But the artifice is because um, the neural network layout looks like a neuron a human neuron, mm-hmm. which has lots and lots of synapsy things, then the nucleus and then the other bit. And it, the synapses listen, and if it gets a big message, then it sends an electric signal to the other thing to do something else, okay? So it's that shape which is a neural network. So all they've done is draw that shape, and then they get data going in, they, they uh, weight it, they make it sort of a stronger signal, or less signal, and then they do some calculations, something comes out, and then they check mm-hmm. using a set of data is that what we'd expect? If not, adapt. You know, and that's basically yeah. artificial learning. So that's the artifice. The uh, intelligence bit is the funny bit because, look, it, all it's doing is learning a data set and therefore allowing it to predict within that data set. Right. It's not learning new stuff. No. So you train up on a, a bit of your data and then see if you can get the other half of the data correct. You know, just this guy to go to hospital based on all the other cases you've seen. Yes, no, yes, no. Oh, yeah, it's working. Okay, and when it comes up with nonsense, then you put a human being and it's called a layer to check out the bias, which says all the people who are naughty should go to jail, whatever it is. Okay, so yeah. the systems you see are computer and the human being telling it what's acceptable socially. Okay, so that's the artifice bit, but the intelligence bit is really nonsense because when you know when you get a latte, when you go to uh, wherever it is, and you get a latte. And you go, I, mm-hmm. I, I'm very modern. I want a skinny latte, but I want it made with uh, oat milk or <laughs> almond milk because I'm so cool. Okay. When you do that <laughs> and you get your latte, they tell you it's a latte. Okay. And you think it's a latte, but it was made with oat milk or almond milk. Why is it not a latte? Because latte means milk. There is no milk in yeah. there because you cannot milk an almond. You, know I mean? you can't milk oats. <laughs> It's not milk. It's not a latte. It's the same with artificial intelligence. It's not intelligent. It's a very fast way of calculating things, finding patterns, and interpolating within a data set. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So when you come to using it for customer centricity, the nightmare you have is, you know how you have a friend, you know their birthday, you know how tall they are, you know what they had for lunch, but you do not know what they want for their wedding anniversary. Mm-hmm. Because that's an insight. That's a creative thing. Are you with me? So the AI can't do that leap. 
the leap you struggle with has all the data. But the good thing is, it's really helpful because it can interpolate stuff really fast. And most of the stuff it writes is, is looks okay, but a lot of it is gibberish, okay? Because it doesn't have any morals. It tells lies. It doesn't know it's telling lies. It doesn't care because it has no morals. There's no memory as well. But as a human being, this is the good bit. You know how sometimes they have like these um, things where they'll write the words all jumbled up letters and they'll say, what mm-hmm. does this sentence say? And they might say, for example, uh, M-S-T-U... P L P O uh, O D, and you go, most people do. And you can read the jumbled letters. Have you had that experience? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Great. Yeah, yeah. That's the joy of your brain leaping to different insights. So even when the AI produces something and it's gibberish, all the humans stand around and go, well, that's really insightful. That's really good. And they imagine the AI coming with insights, but it's not something in their own brains. <laughs> <laughs> And um, yeah, and everyone's spending all their money and time on that, and they don't even understand what it is. But maybe not. <laughs> well, <laughs> if I had to summarize today's conversation, I would say be wary of the IT police and the mutants. <laughs> Just focus on the customer, and you can't milk almonds like that. <laughs> that would be you can't that would milk be. almonds. Just remember that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. This has been incredible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And just coming back to Wham, just one, if there's a takeaway, like what do you, what does it mean for the future of an organization that's trying to build a high performance company? Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's quite difficult. I mean, I've, I've highlighted some of the elements. And one of the things we are doing next year, for example, is we've looked at exactly this problem, which is, you know, what does it mean for these organizations who are struggling to actually build these high performance companies? And we've come to the conclusion that what we want, we're going to do next year in particular, is me and my two partners, uh, David Lomas and Tammy Watchorn, basically what we're going to do is we're going to use five clients and we're going to go in as, then we're not really consultants, we're going to go in and we're going to really work with them and basically go through the things we've been discussing, but really steadily and slowly. And we're going to Mm -hmm. pull the right tools and pets. We're going to use Cube as a process to do it. We're going to help them understand things like the internal customer and the alignment. We're going to help them challenge the external pressures of some of the things which are crazy, which they're doing, like their ESG-ish stuff. And Mm -hmm. we're we're only going to do five clients because it's so difficult for the clients to do it themselves unless they Mm -hmm. have internal weirdos, internal infective weirdos. So Mm -hmm. you have to help them look at the future in a more effective way to use the capabilities like AI capabilities sensibly to understand that the future of work is about collaboration, really not made up collaboration. What does that mean? And what types of behavior, technology, infrastructure they need? You've got to get them into learning mode to realize what they have to learn, which is hard, what is soft about each other, how they're going to integrate. And then you need to work on the culture and the systems and really the rituals, which they'll continue after we've let them left them off. But that's what you you need to do all those those things. Um, so it's not mm-hmm. a sort of quick fix thing. So that's why yeah. we're going to do five. We're going to try and find CEOs who are serious and really mm-hmm. want to transform. And then we'll talk to all the board and then we'll put together how we're going to do it. Then we'll explore their mark. They'll provide the, the data. We'll provide the questions. And then we'll figure out how we transform the organization uh, to mm-hmm. be able to do that. Because transformation is a nightmare. Um, the, the reason it's difficult is all those things have to happen. And... And they have to be in three phases. The first phase, I'll give you an analogy. You don't go to caterpillars for flying lessons. Mm -hmm. Caterpillars are good at walking, eating leaves. Their KPIs are how many leaves have you eaten today and stuff like that. So if that's the KPI, guess what? They eat really small leaves. (laughs) So they're good at that. Butterflies are good at drinking nectar and flying and looking attractive. You don't go to a caterpillar for flying lessons. When people start on transformation, they don't understand where they're going to go. But they're so keen to prove they know where they're going because that's the old world way of doing things. Right. But they choose something which is not a transformation. And then they fail anyway. And it was difficult to hire that high performance because all the metrics they put in place get in their own way. So what we have to do is figure out what they need to do to keep the caterpillar alive, keep the existing customers, the cash flow, the minimum. We're mm. going to protect that. 
Then the question is, what's all the bits of scaffolding we have to build? We have to understand new customers. We have to understand the data. We have to understand how they're going to work. What's the culture? How many people? Which partners are we going to go for? So there's a scaffolding, which is the cocoon. And then as you start to build that, you start to understand what the butterfly will really look like. And as the butterfly emerges, you can then take the revenue and the requirement into the new income streams and the new customer support, whilst at the same time starting to dismantle some of the cocoon. And that's that's basically mm-hmm. the mechanism which we're going to work with with five clients because everything else, uh, they can do it themselves. I mean, I, I've described it, I've written in books and things like that, but they really need the leadership and the weirdos and the understanding of this complexity and they can't just go running around copying everyone else. It, it's, it's just, it doesn't work. Mm-hmm. I mean, your shareholders won't complain because they'll say, you're doing the same as everyone else. So, yeah. You know, yeah. But if you're all sinking together, what's the point? Yeah. <laughs> Eddie, how can people find out more about you? Oh, I don't want them to find out anything more about me. I'm an introvert. <laughs> <laughs> Get away from me. <laughs> EddieObeng.com, uh, Pentacle the Virtual Business, Pentacle of VBS.com, or Cube.cc. Cube.cc is a good place to go because if you register, I, I spend a lot of my time there. So if you register and then you ping me, we can always hook up and, and have a conversation. And if you're one of those CEOs who really wants to do something different, definitely get in touch. We're, we're going to pair it down to about five uh, and we're only going to choose uh, organizations we think are ready to change. You know, earlier I was saying, V, I was saying uh, about most organizations are, they're not there. They're, they're too busy. Yeah. Yeah. So we're not. So if you're one of those, don't contact us. But if you're serious, please do. And uh, we're, <laughs> going to try and, we're going to try and do that next year and make a big difference. This has been and incredible. The difference awesome. we make is what you decide because you're the customer, you're mm-hmm. the stakeholder. We can't make your, your life better. <laughs> 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 oh my gosh! <laughs> Brilliant! This is has that, been incredible. Is that your fun guy voice? Is that the fun guy voice? <laughs> <laughs> fun oh, this has been great, like Eddie. <laughs> <laughs> it's the most ridiculous Thanks, thing Eddie. that I hear so many people say it, and I just want to—I don't know how to react to it. Oh, we're going to save the planet. Uh, how can you say that? You don't know what's on the planet. You know what the planet <laughs> wants. <laughs> How mad are you? You know, uh, yeah, and it's it's quite intriguing because the other thing they then do is they then decide on the solution, and the solution is not com- connected to the problem which they had indicated. So they go, right, we're going to put lots of I don't know solar panels. I'm going, so what was the problem you're trying to solve? Oh, it's CO two. So hang on, how do you get from CO two to solar panels? <laughs> <laughs> you know, there are steps in between. Are you sure of the solution? You know, so it's absolutely hilarious. But that's the world we live in. It's classic world after midnight. The pace is so fast yeah. that you're no longer being able to learn. And so you grab at something that most people don't know how to tell you that what you're grabbing at is nonsense because they don't know how to think critically. Yeah. Um, and the, Have we got time for a last lesson? Yeah. Cool. Five methods of trying to make sense of whether something makes sense or not. Okay. Most of us have no clue what's real, what's true, and it's 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 just one of those headaches. Truth is really hard to see. Millions of years, people thought that the sun went around the earth. Why would they think that? Is it because they were primitive? No, it's because even to us, it looks like the sun's going around the earth. Makes sense, yeah. okay? So the sun's <laughs> obviously going around the earth. So then you go, well, how is it working? You know? And so they come up with mechanisms. So some people say, there's a chariot which goes across in the day and then by night it takes the moon. Other people say, actually, the sun is a big blob of yellow on the inside of a blue bowl Okay, so yellow and a blue bowl, and that bowl is on the top, and there's another bowl which is black with a white dot, and the bowls rotate, <laughs> and that's mm-hmm. how the sun goes around the earth. Makes sense. Look at the sky. It would look like that. Okay, we of course are sophisticated. We know that the earth goes around the sun. Is that right? Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah, but the yeah, reason you yeah, get yeah. day and night is not because the earth's going around the sun. It's because it's rotating. So, so, mm-hmm. so it's difficult to see the truth. Really hard. It, it, even your eyes deceive you, okay? So there's yeah. only four methods to guess whether something's real or not. Or not. Let me rephrase that. There's four, five methods to figure out whether something's not real because you can't prove it's real. You can only prove it's not real. First method is prediction method. Somebody says, our KPIs show that we're going to double our sales, okay? Write it down in your diary. By when? Friday. Write it in your diary. Wait till Friday. Did the sales double? If the sales doubled, they might be telling the truth. The sales didn't double. You know those KPIs are definitely wrong. 
Mm-hmm. So prediction, number one, mm-hmm. most important. Second one is, look for the dog that didn't bark. There's a lovely Sherlock Holmes story where a place gets burgled. The people in the house say it's the gypsies down the road. Um, Sherlock Holmes turns up. There's a big wolf, Irish wolfhound. He says, did the dog bark? They say no. And he goes, that's curious. Okay. And what he's saying is basically, if the people had come from the gypsy camp, the dog would have barked. The dog didn't bark, therefore. So you're looking for what's missing. So if somebody tells you, oh, well, with our current strategy, we're, we're going to get lots and lots of growth. And then you look and all the customers are the same customers you've always had. You know there are no new customers. You go, there's something missing here. Okay? Mm-hmm. And so it's probably made up. It's not true. Okay? So that's the, that's the second method. The third, of course, is science, which none of us can do. And neither can the scientists, as we've discovered. Most of the, the papers which I've peer reviewed are just made up. So we'll skip that one. Um, (laughs) (laughs) The fourth is the baby method. Anyone can do that. Somebody tells you anything. You want to know if it's false. Use the baby method. Babies see things, they touch them. So see, touch, taste. So they use multiple senses to check whether the things then real. Yeah. So I'm going to be naughty, but for years they've been telling us the sea levels are rising. So I'm like, oh my goodness, sea levels rise, sea levels. So I thought, Venice, Venice, is Venice underwater? So I went and looked at the map of Venice and it's exactly the same as it was. So I know that the sea levels are not going up. You with me? You look at another thing. You don't look at the measurements they're making. You go and look at what's actually happening. Or you go to the insurance industry, are you charging twice as much for seafront properties? They go, no. So, so when you use another sense, you can tell whether or not it's being made up. So it's really crucial to look at multiple things from different dimensions. Uh, and then the the, uh, the last um, uh, method is evolution. Um, I mean, we've joked about the monkeys and everyone eating the red berries. So if you went somewhere and everyone was eating the blueberries, it's not true. They're not all innovative. It, it's not possible because evolution doesn't do that. And we know what happens with evolution. We know how it clusters things together. You know how it makes sure that, you know, if there's a, a, a flower like this, there's a moth with the same proboscis and so on. So if somebody suggests something and it doesn't feel like it, it could work in nature, it's probably just made up. Um, <laughs> so, so those are useful things to stop you chasing change, which other people mm-hmm. are doing, and to focus on your own improvement. Awesome. I ran out of space. This is great. <laughs> I ran out of time. Life works that way. See, I told you, nature sorts everything. One second, every second. Guys, I'm going to have to go. <laughs> Thanks so very much, Eddie. This, this was incredible. Really fun. Good luck with the podcast. It's Thank actually, you. it's, it's a fantastic you. podcast from the ones I looked at before coming here. So well done as well. So good luck and oh, well done. You. It's a couple of blokes from you. Canada. Brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> we need more of that. We need more of that. <laughs> Thank you very much. Just before we get to the post pod with V and I, I'd like to take a second and just ask to see if you could leave a review. We are always looking for ways to make this show better and really love your feedback. V, you got a jingle? Oh. <laughs> no. I don't know why I should. <laughs> I'm just You have one job, now. man. I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I got one job and I never get it right. It's the post pod. It's oh. the post pod. I don't know. I'm I'm running dry myself. <laughs> or pew, 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 pew. I should get my guitar. We can play. We can. I. We should make our own jingle with the guitar. See, yeah. Like you're 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 the, actually the musician between the two of us. So. Yeah. Well, come on, man. Kind of. I'm not the <laughs> pew, 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 musician, but I can figure something out. I'll, I'll work on that. I'll, I'll get right, the man. guitar. We'll figure that out. All right um yeah so eddie (laughs) wow wow yeah Yeah. holy smokes there's so much energy it (laughs) so much energy he's so like i remember when i was when i first met him i was like um doing this apprenticeship that i did with him in cube for like six months and it really did transform the way i work Mm mm-hmm entirely for like and, and still i use the hopes and fears thing and you we were talking yeah. about that but um it's really interesting like i kept thinking back to that line about if you were to design a high performance organization to like from scratch right how would you do it and work backwards from that and what you end up with might not be what you have as an organization 
That's a good point. Where and so it's funny because and he talked about it, it's hard to change once you already have established the systems yeah. and processes. And so you then would naturally look to like a startup point of view where you go, okay, well, if it's a startup, we need to focus on how we're going to grow. But the startup is like, no, we just need to find money. And so we're not yeah. really worried about how we're going to grow. And and so it's almost one of those things where you're like, it's an afterthought for everyone. Totally. And then once you're too big, you get to a point where it's like, well, it's too hard to change. Let's leave it. So it's interesting about like, where does the... Where does the the where's the right opportunity to create the dis, the actual systems and processes around how the team and the functions to become a high output high performance organization? You know, it's interesting because for me, when when I was when he was kind of walking through talking about like a true virtual collaboration versus kind of like what a lot of organizations have yeah. today, then I think you really start realizing well, actually, there are. I, I saw your eyes light up actually when, when you when you talked about the document thing. Yeah, because I think for me it's like you, we usually you're in a meeting. What do you do? You assign one person. Hey, Mark, do you mind like taking notes today? Yeah, and of course they like there's tools today that you can kind of uh, get auto notes and stuff like that. But I think for me it's like when it's a shared document, everyone has an equal responsibility and plugging in the information. All of a sudden, that becomes a lot more tangible. And it's not that I interpreted something one way mm -hmm. versus someone else interpreted some, something differently, right? Mm -hmm. So I think it kind of, I can see how that brings, can bring people together a lot differently mm -hmm. than what we traditionally do. Because it's almost like we took our natural behaviors in the office and we've just translated them online, mm -hmm. like through the tools that we have today. Whereas something like his platform is actually a little bit unique and it, it, it kind of works around their own rituals mm -hmm. um, kind of really like the, the well, what is it? The, not the hypothetical, but like the synchronous sipping, I think he called it. Yeah. Yeah. Which I thought was like super interesting. I think you took a sip of your cup and I was trying to find my yeah. cup <laughs> so I could take one too. <laughs> but yeah. you know, when, when, when you start thinking about it a little bit differently, you can see why, you know, the remote structure maybe isn't at its peak yet. Um, or at least not across, you know, the, the yeah. majority of, of organizations looking to adopt it. So it was just fascinating. The, the, so one of those rituals that he has is, and he, and he's built all these pets. So a pet for lack of a better description of it is essentially a slide. Mm -hmm. And the slide is designed to generate a specific conversation. So there's a framework, like, let's say the, uh, like a SWOT analysis. That would be like a pet of some kind. Right. He probably doesn't have that, but it's there's things like that, right? Yeah. So you fill in the blocks. You know, what are the strengths? What are the weaknesses? And that's that's what he's meaning about, about those. Um, I just lost my train of thought. What was it? <laughs> uh, talking about pets and structure or that he uses that as essentially as um, oh yeah, sorry. Rituals. Yeah, yeah. So the rituals part, like this, the right first speak second is is one of those things. So that's a pet that like he's Im implemented as a part of his ritual. Yeah. Um, and if you think about it, it's fa like it's fascinating because you have these opportunities to create inclusion yeah. and diver and and you, we were talking about diversity. You bring diverse people together. But what happens often is you have someone who speaks first, never writes anything later. And we all have seen this where there's, the, you know, the person with the loudest voice is the one that en ends up just having the most dominant airtime. Yeah. And then you have all these people sitting in the room with diverse backgrounds and experiences and value to add to the conversation. And they never get heard because they don't speak loudly enough or they can't think on their feet quickly or they don't what if for various reasons they just quiet yeah and so the writing first speaking second thing makes sure that everyone has a chance to like write contribute. down their yeah, yeah contribute write down their idea and then mm -hmm. you literally go around and what he talked about with spin casting is like you go around the circle and everyone gets a chance to say something mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um and so like you know we don't do that but no. amazon thinking about this does do that and that was one of bezos's things where you have to write down something and we're not going to have a meeting until everyone's read the document and they read the document in the meeting room. 
I wonder what it, it was it like the memo or something like, and yeah. like they don't have presentations there. It's literally yeah. these, these documents. Um, yeah, you have to use. write your thoughts. Right. And then, yeah. and then in the meeting, because everyone's say they're going to read it, but then they don't. And so Nobody in the does. meeting, you read the document so that then you can have a conversation about it. Yeah. So there is a, an, there, at least one example of like effective cultures or like, um, uh, high performance cultures in the yeah. real world in comparison to the world that he created. So it is yeah. possible to do some of these things. It, like He touched on so many different things and spoke about them at a very high velocity. So even like my note taking, I can barely read it right now because it's just so much, but you, you could pick up on a few things there where, you know, you, culture becomes important, making sure that you're, you know, incubating and, and allowing that, mm -hmm. um, that sense of, uh, what's the right word shared accountability maybe mm -hmm. um but then it's almost like to actually so even if you have a culture and you haven't built in the mechanics needed to fo to either continue to foster that or grow that then it's going to fall flat mm -hmm. but he used i think it was called he called it the sliced bread so, he, yeah 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 so that's that's another one that kind of stuck out to me where it's like okay um and i i think when when you're trying to build these teams for both a virtual setting and a, you know, hybrid setting or whatever, mm -hmm. th there's a lot of comp complexity that's involved and we naturally sure. just default to what's comfortable. Totally. But if we're really trying to build these high performance teams, we probably do have to approach it a lot differently than we have in the past. And yeah. this is where some of these methodologies, some of these, um, his ideas actually would work really well. Yeah. Um, in this new state. Totally. Well, it, like picture, and this happens all the time like picture a meeting room remote work back to the office yeah cool if there is only one office you can see how like okay there's more comfort there because yeah. in terms of like management and being all together and all that kind of stuff but throw in a secondary office in any way and you have a meeting room boardroom where people are being piped in through that screen totally like how often do the people on the other side of the screen get ignored all the time all the time. So all of a sudden you're like, no matter if you're back to the office or not, yeah. you're back to the same problem yeah. of like, well, how do we include people? It is hybrid, no matter what. Like it's always probably going to be hybrid. There's always going to be someone piped in. And how do you get value from the organization for having the person participate in that That's and not just ignore point. them? That's a great point. Yeah, it's it's fa like, well, if you think about it, things have changed so much for us um, as a, as a generation, you know. And you you can look at it and say, you know, we're, we're later in our careers, you know, for for the lack of uh, a better way of saying it. But it's it's interesting now the shift that we're seeing, where you know we, we everyone went remote. Now it's like this it looks like more organized, really prioritizing yeah. the hybrid kind of style. Agreed. But we know that remote's not going to go away. Right. There'll likely be another shift at some point. Like, you know what? We were only able to get people back in the office twice a week. Do we still need this real estate? Right. So there's probably a second, there's a, probably a third wave that's going to come here over the next few years where you'll still, you'll probably start seeing more prioritization back to the remote side um, than what it, what it is that we're going through today. Mm -hmm. And it, for me, it's, there's so many things that we have to change on how we work mm -hmm. in this remote setting to become more, um, uh, more efficient, mm -hmm. uh, more creative, more, uh, I don't, better in our roles and yeah. leading through these forums as well. And I think that's, it was just interesting to hear, listen to him talk and what I would have kind of considered, um, uh, well, that's just how we do it. Actually, this not the right way of doing it. And, I think that's what I'm, uh, I'm now finding myself like, Jesus, I have to rethink a, a few things here. And, you know, and I, I'm just ha happy that he highlighted some of them. Mm -hmm. like the shared notes idea. I think is a great way of kind of keeping everybody accountable. Um, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Even like you talked about memory um, in those documents. And so the way that that mm -hmm. cube space works, it, it literally is like a, a virtual reality space. And, and so when you leave a, a, a room it's like leaving a physical room if you left something on the whiteboard it stays on the whiteboard yeah 
And so that's where that idea around the memory comes from. Whereas, that's and great. I'm sure you've seen this too. Like, I can't tell you how many times we get into a meeting anywhere I've been and we have a shared doc. Great. And we're all contributing it. Great. But then when some, we shut it down. We're like, Oh, where is the link to that document? No, not that's the old document. Remember that's we updated it and yeah. then like, and then you spend hours trying to find things. Yeah. And so part of it is like that placement memory of where things are. Totally. That's hard to replicate if you're just using SharePoint. Yeah. Um, one thing, uh, one other thing I really wanted to, to highlight is his, his, uh, his formula, his information formula. So he's yeah. like, question plus data equals information. And I think seeing it linearly that way, I think that's also changed my way that I look at, that I look at. It's like you, you provide the data, mm -hmm. you formulate the questions around the data, and that's, what's going to actually create the information. Mm -hmm. So I can even see this right now using this in a day-to-day -day perspective where people are going to throw numbers at you, but what do they actually mean? Mm -hmm. Are you asking the right question around that to receive that number or vice mm -hmm. versa? And I think, again, it's, it's, it's a it's very small, subtle thing, but it's a shift in the way that you think yeah. around how to collect that information. Cause that's yeah. what we should be after is the information. Um, and or I guess you can also loosely call that insights. Maybe the information then leads to insights. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I thought that well, was and the really quality. Cool yeah. And then, you know, as a gut check is the quality of data, the right quality to be able to answer the question. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. That was an interesting one. The other one that uh, really kind of struck a uh, chord with me was his orienting to the customer. Like if you saw, if you orient to the customer, you're going to solve most of your problems. Cause one of the things, actually, the sleeping barber, the name of the sleeping barber, the reason that I originally loved that story is because the idea between connecting, you can add value to an organization by just connecting yeah. the silos. And so organizations are often drawn like a pyramid. Yeah. And they're structured like a pyramid. And that pyramid reports to the CEO. And usually at the bottom, you have customers. Mm -hmm. And then that's your, your, um, your base level employee group, mm -hmm. right? The customer interfacing group of people. And so you design this organization around reporting up to a CEO instead of reporting down to the customer. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. if you inverse that and orient to the customer, then you are very likely to end up with some other structure. Yeah. That, because you're, you know, there's a customer that you're serving, and then there's internal customers you're serving. You're, it cha it flips the idea around how you add value. Yeah, because you're no longer just reporting up; you're reporting to create value for the customer, and that includes internal customers. Which then made me think about the promise to the customer stuff we were talking about with Roger Martin. <laughs> yeah, and how, how like important that is. You know, if you are going to make a promise to the customer, then everything in behind that promise needs to align like a boxer's punch, not just like some kid throwing a haymaker on the totally. scooter. Totally. Totally. What I loved about his comment, and the way I interpreted that is at the end of the day, and it's things that we've we've heard throughout everyone that we've kind of interviewed, I think back to Andrea Olson, um, you know, obviously the promise to the customer with with Roger Martin it really all starts and finishes with that. And as long mm -hmm. as that you can apply that lens internally uh, to your organizations, to you know, the products that you're building, the service that you're providing, that's how you can be successful. And that's probably how you'll be able to maintain a sense of velocity or at least a little more alignment to mm -hmm. how the world is changing around us so rapidly. Mm -hmm. Because remember, he's talking the world after midnight. And that for me also, I don't want to say it painted like a, a dark picture, but it kind of like made me realize like there's some people or some organizations that are able to move quicker than mm -hmm. others. Well, why is that? Is it because of their relentless focus on the customer? Is it their their ability to kind of look at what's happening around them and really compartmentalize it and make it actionable internally? I want to guess, and this is just a hypothesis, that they're probably a lot more closer to the consumer and the consumer's needs. So they really understand the mm -hmm. research side of it. So when I think about how he, how he, how he said it for me, it, it becomes like a no brainer. And then you talked about inversing that pyramid and now thinking about that. I'm, I don't report to a CEO. Maybe mm -hmm. I do in this function, 
of my responsibilities to the consumer, mm -hmm. that should change the way that you think and you apply um, your, your, your strategies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. There's so many little nuggets in there. I, I agree oh. with you though. Like the, the, yeah, it does. Cause yeah, the, the strategy part isn't about serving your boss. It's about serving the customer. And so, you know, thinking about like, again, Bezos and Amazon, like having a chair. Yeah that represents the customer in every meeting is actually kind of an interesting ritual to, to like make that a visual reminder. Yeah. Of why you're doing things and what you're doing them for. And it's not altruistic in, in terms of like, you know, we're, we're Should all it be. We're, it's, you know, we're making a profit. <laughs> yeah. We're making that for this customer by serving this customer. Well, not by like making sure my boss thinks, I'm doing a good job. No, and man. Well, it's it, it's it's for for me at least. It's it's something. It's a it's a very maybe practical is not the right way to say it, but it's a very strong visual that if you can you know highlight or bring that empty chair into a room because you have like an in person meeting, um, you can you know it becomes a very strong visual reference to be like so the person that's sitting here pretending to be the customer or hypothetical customer. What would they be saying right now? Mm -hmm. Is this in their best interest? This is not in their best interest. And I know I've been a part of decisions um, that probably didn't think about it through the lens of the consumer um, in that in that moment, just because mm -hmm. we had to think about profitability. We had to think about, hey, we needed to save dollars. We needed to make all decisions that were probably on the opposite spectrum of what a consumer would want. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's the altruistic aspect it's like maybe not all decisions can be made even though they should be um mm -hmm. i don't know it's can be a yeah. little bit messy too but i can totally the other one that i was, I was as we were talking about like the you know the red monkey either the red fruit and the blue fruit and the monkeys all falling they're <laughs> eating the same thing and and benchmarking and i started thinking back to the mps <clears throat> interview that we had like mm. nps is a perfect example of of the following the herd mentality um, yeah. where, you know, it's not so much that people are actually, people want transformation, but actually they don't, they say they want it, but they don't, yeah. they just want to change enough that makes it look like they're progressing mm. um, in line with everyone else. Cause it's yeah. comfortable. Right. And so NPS yeah. is a perfect example of that. I mean, that two thirds of all fortune 500 companies use this metric. It's and it actually doesn't do anything. It doesn't yeah. measure any of the things that it was promised to measure, but you here can benchmark are. each other. And so here we are, right? So that's kind of a fascinating like example to me around like the, the herd mentality. And so I think it does take a lot of courage though to to buck the trend and Here's to be to the, the one third. Ones. Yeah. And be the one third of the companies that don't do that and don't follow the trend. Even if that means that you're internal uh, and you're saying that, hey, great, I know we're, we're, we have NPS. We're picking on NPS again. But being that voice to say, hey, what are we actually doing with this metric? What does mm -hmm. it actually mean? What are we trying to measure? And we're using NPS to try to measure that. And I don't think that's a bad, like, no. to have that. And I think you need probably more of that. People that can kind of mm -hmm. um, question, you know, how we do things, why we do things a, cer a certain way. And remember, anytime you enter in a, a a new role somewhere, usually the first thing that they'll tell you is like, question everything. You know, mm -hmm. we've just been doing things this way for so long. We're probably just blinded by our own ignorance. Mm -hmm. And I think there was a stat, uh, or maybe it wasn't a stat, like you start, you start losing that ability to see things differently within totally. the th first three months. Right. Right. Then then you start becoming yourself conditioned to the way of working that, say, your new organization yeah. is. So I think being able to maintain and flex the capacity to challenge things, I think, is yeah. really important, whether you're a mutant or yeah. someone that's completely, you know, has a few screws loose in their head, as, as Eddie kind of put it. I think for me, it's, there's a lot of value in making sure mm -hmm. that you're incubating that um, that sense of, you know, of challenge. Yeah. 
Well, it's funny because oftentimes those new people are a lot of times just by volume, the, the young yeah. people in an organization um, and that are asking some good questions around mm -hmm. like, you know, why you do it this way? And often you get the response from someone more senior going, oh, you don't understand. That's the way things work. Totally. Right. <laughs> totally. And so the dismissive. And so as a leader, that actually should be a moment in time where you go, okay, that's a really good question. <laughs> at the knowing that there is a best before date. Yeah. For, for information yeah. around the way we do things. It's kind of an opportunity just to gut check, make sure that, the reasons why you're doing things haven't expired yeah and that the best before date is still valid and, still maybe, valid. and then from that point on maybe you extend the best before date you know whenever those Good kinds point. of questions come up yeah it's interesting i don't know this uh this was a, a great conversation to start my day i, I have to admit i'm energized now yeah. <laughs> I'm like, let's go. <laughs> Thank you, Eddie. Yeah. yeah, thanks, Eddie. And we'll put all there's so many links to put in for him, but uh, uh and that we talked about, but we'll add a whole bunch of those in here. But yeah, this was um definitely a, a different conversation than I thought uh we were going to have. And I was I was just blown away. I was blown I'm, away. I love I was it. excited watching it through your eyes because <laughs> <laughs> I've it's like seeing it for the first time again, yeah, yeah, almost yeah. like traveling. I'm like, oh, this is Whoa. fun. It's like a time warp for me. I'm like, oh, I remember it, like having that look. <laughs> <laughs> That's my look. <laughs> no, it was it was um, it was incredible, man. That yeah. was that was awesome. Thank you, so. Eddie. Thank you. All right, V. Until next time, go chase profitability. Oh, you did it. We pew, did it. Pew, 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 pew. <laughs> <laughs> Look at yeah. us. I'm it's only taken us like soon. <laughs> over 40 episodes. <laughs> All right. Take it easy, buddy. All right, buddy. Take care.